Okay, welcome to our Index Fresh Seminar 26, everybody. I really appreciate you taking the time to come out today and join us. We have uh, a really nice uh, presentations uh, prepared for you today. We have a pretty full menu of uh, four speakers talking today. We're going to start off on uh, Seminar 26 with Gerardo Aldenate. He's our agronomist for Index Fresh and giving a... Uh, kind of a uh, jump start into spring cultural uh, inputs and, and get the um, ideas on what we can be focusing on to uh, increase the uh, spring, spring growth and um, improve fruit set and yields for upcoming crop. And then we will jump into our kind of main topic of today's meeting, which is uh, irrigation technology and automation. And that we, we brought in three vendors, um, providers of, of technical service and hardware that can give you a complete turnkey system. But it's something that we've wanted to do to get the information directly from the um, suppliers to give you good information that you can bring back into the field and make a decision on something that may be applicable for you in your orchards. Um, it's a lot of really high tech uh, inventive equipment that they're using that they can provide to you but ultimately the results can be an improvement in the bottom line so it's not just a bunch of fancy equipment and, and online applications that you can do to turn turn on and off valves but ultimately saving you money utilizing the the resource in a more um, efficient use and saving you time and labor that will hopefully help improve the bottom line for you um, so we'll start off with um, agenda with Gerardo with the spring tips, and then we will go into a uh, talk from Phytech, and then we'll switch to WiseCon, and then we'll finish up with a, a presentation from Netafim. So with that, uh, we can get underway, and please welcome Gerardo Aldenate. My topics, I'm gonna tell you about avocado phenology, pollination, irrigation, fertilizer, pruning, harvest, tree health, and plant growth regulator. All in just 25 minutes, okay? Okay, avocado phenology. It's important to know where we are and what is next, okay? We are in the beginning of the season, and we have to know what is next, okay? Remember, avocado phenology. The avocado phenology is your navigation map. It's important to know the timing, the timing of different growth stage. It's the critical point to do, to do the labor in the right time. That is the main reason that you have to know the phenological stage of your trees. Okay, it's very, very important. It's very critical. If you ask me, I have seen working, I, I'm, I, I'm working with different growers in different country, and the main difference, the success and the, and, and the, and the bad result, one probably most of the time. The reason is not to do the labor in the right time, okay? Look what is happening in, in spring. Flowering, fruit set, early fruit growth, spring shoot, and initial root flush. I mean the tree is is working, it's gonna be working a lot, a lot. All these events in the same time. That means a period of a strong tree demands. That means no stress, good irrigation, good fertilization, pruning, all just in, if you see here, all in almost just three months, 12 weeks. We have only 12 weeks to make our next crop, just 12 weeks okay if you see 
most of your trees are in this stage, cauliflower state, stage, and then anthedis, when the flower is opening, okay? And petal fall in the end of April, probably beginning of May, okay? If we, if we look this, from now to the end of this set, we have only almost eight weeks, okay? Eight weeks. We know the rain, the cool weather, is affecting, sure, the flowering, delaying the flowering, delaying the set. Huh? But keep in mind, just six to eight weeks. If we mix what is happening with the flowering, Plus, the vegetative growth look the same. Cauliflower, antecin, our new crop, and in the same time, a spring flash. And the beginning, if you see the blue, blue line, the beginning of the root flash. Too much energy. And probably, you are seeing your trees a little bit yellow, the winter with, with a lot of rain and cold weather, for sure is a stress. Avocado trees don't like that, okay? They don't like that, okay? And it's important to keep in mind that in the beginning of this season, to adjust, I told you, to adjust irrigation, fertilization, pruning, okay? First step, pollination. Okay. First step to setting a commercial crop. Pollination. Who is doing that? Bees. Okay. Bees. There is enough information support, su supporting how benefit are the bees. What kind of bees? We know there is native bees. But we need the help of honey bees. Okay? If there is no pollination, there is no crop. Okay? No pollination, no crop. Okay? Climate is affecting the flowering, is affecting the, the fruit set. The fruit set sure is affecting. Look, temperature below 50 to 86 degrees are really at the best temperature to have a good set. But if, if we, if we, excuse me, if we, if we look the records that we have now so far, probably it's too cold, okay? I have seen the flower, the flower, the, the, the flower elongated, not opening, that is good. That is really good. I prefer to see the flower opening with warmer weather, okay? But it's important to keep records. It's very, very important to keep records to know what is going on or when you will have good condition for set, okay? Bees. The first step, bees. Very, very important. We say minimum four to five beehives per acre. Mature trees, big trees, okay? big trees, okay? But it's important, at least one per acre, two per acre, okay? The other thing, I have seen a beautiful mountains, beautiful hills with a lot of native flower. That is competition for, for avocado flowering. That is really big, and normally the honeybees prefer other kind of flower. They don't like so much the avocado flower, okay? Keep in mind that. If you, if you are close to uh, an area with beautiful native flower, for sure you have to increase the number of beehives, okay? That is a kind of decision that, that you have to take now, okay? Adjust the number and then, for, and then, and keep in mind, bees will not fly in less than 60 degrees. My concern is to have a uh, Cool and wet spring. Cloudy days, 
You know, happened the same in Chile last season. And the final result, the final result was 30% less crop. That was the final result uh, to have a, a cool and wet spring, okay? There's a few days with good condition for set. That is my concern here, okay? And that is the reason why it's so important for me to have the beehives, a healthy hives, a strong bees working, to, uh, enjoying the, the, the days with good, good condition. Because normally, normally, with a cool and wet spring, I told you, the flowering, the flowering and set are late, and you have only good condition normally in the second part of your flowering, or, or the end of your flowering. You have two, three, four days with good condition, okay? It's important to have your bees in this time, okay? You know that, you know that. So far, I have seen in general really good, good, strong uh, hives. Very good, okay? In, I, I, in, 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 different can, in, in other countries, I have seen not so uh, good hives quality. But here, I have seen really good, good, good quality. But it's important. It's important to keep in, some, in good places, plenty of sunlight, okay? Sunlight stimulate the... the the bees activity, very, very important, okay? It's easy to bring in the, the bees. You can say many growers told me, you know, I have the bees, Gerardo. I have one, two, three hives per acre. Okay, but you have check. They are, they are visiting the avocado flower. Are they visiting the avocado flower? Are they working in good condition? Are they, they look really strong? It's very simple. Check the bees activity. Really very, very simple. I remember, probably was two or three years ago here in California, discussing with two growers, neighbor. Um, close up, very nice mountain, full of, 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 uh, of native flower. And as an um, checking, okay, bees, okay. I, I brought the bees, perfect. Um, how many? Two, two per acre, okay, perfect. But did you, see the, did you see the native flower? Yes. Did you, did you bring more bees? No, okay. The neighbor, the same question. Did you see the native flower? Yes. Yes, I saw the native flower. And I took the decision, I brought one more hives. Big difference set. Big, big difference. Okay? That kind of decision sounds simple, but are really very, very, very important. Okay? Just walking around your trees. One minute. Counting bees. It's easy. One minute. Minimum. I would say minimum 40 bees. If you can count 40 bees visiting your trees, it's perfect. It's perfect. Okay? But it's important to check. It's important to check. Okay? I don't like to hear after the set, you know, Gerardo, look, the set was not so good. There was a huge amount of flour. Okay. Okay, let me see your information. Temperature, I don't have. Okay, how many beehives? Oh, I use four per acre. Okay, show me, show me your, 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 mm, your numbers. How many, how, many, how many bees were visiting your, 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 your trees? I don't have that. Okay. We have to start to have records. We need information, okay? We need information. It's very, very important. And it's simple. It's really simple. Just walk, walk around your tree, 
One minute, I'm counting bees. It's not difficult. Okay? Keep in mind, first step, bees. When I was in, I was in the south, I haven't seen too many uh, trees here, but probably you have to have your bees the next, next week or in the next 10 days. You have to have your bees in your ranch, okay? Irrigation. After a wet winter, cool, difficult to start, okay? Really very difficult to start. But keep in mind, the efficiency of the rain is no more than 20%. It's no more than 20%, okay? Compared the, compare the normal irrigation. It's no more than 20%, okay? That means sometimes during winter with rain, you need irrigation? Yes, you need irrigation, okay? Especially if you are using salty water, it's very, very important to keep your salt far away of your root system. And sometimes you have to irrigate during the rain, okay? During the rain. Keep in mind that, okay? It's very important. Um, then the other speaker will talk about some, some devices to monitor the moisture in in the root area. For sure, that kind of techniques, that kind of device can help you to take the decision. But it's important, it's important to have in mind, you cannot think, because there was a lot of rain, you don't need to irrigate. The tree needs irrigation in where the roots are growing, okay? Remember, the, the avocado canopy is like a big umbrella, okay? That is the main reason that the efficiency of the rain compared to irrigation is really very, very low, okay? And the other thing, flowers at at least 13% increase the transpiration. Okay, the flower increases the, the transpiration of the tree. Some scientists say 15, 16, others say 13%. I don't care. I know, I know with a huge amount of flower, I have to increase a little bit my irrigation. Okay? And many times, doesn't mean I have to use more water. Just increasing the frequency could help a lot your trees. And applying the same amount of water, okay? Just the same amount of water, just increasing, increasing the frequency, okay? I could say so far here in California, during flowering, you should irrigate weekly. I mean, once a week. Especially if you are seeing a huge amount of flower that I call yellow trees, when you see only flower, at least once a week, okay? If you can do that, it's gonna be perfect, okay? At least once a week, okay? Just to show you some trees under stress during flowering, can you see the wilting flower? That is for sure, that is not the idea, okay? The final result, in that ranch was no set, no set. Look, look the, look the flower, okay? But that is not idea, okay? I told you about records. I told you about information, okay? This is the basic information that you have to know in your condition, in your area. How many gallons I have to irrigate my tree in January, in February, in March, April. It's the basic information that you have to know. Okay. Here is just an example. 
you can see here the ET0. This is the evaporation. I took that information from CIMI's website. It's public information. You can get information. You can get the number of your area and, and apply the crop factor. Crop factor is adjustment. It's just a number to adjust the evaporation, thinking in the avocado tree, OK? My recommendation is, if we see March, at least to apply 80% of the evaporation, OK? Now I know, in this case, in this sample, from 3.4 inches, I have to apply 2.7 inches, because I use 80%. I would like to irrigate 80%, OK? Easy. And then, because normally we use gallons per tree, using this for, for formula, I can change from inches to gallons per acre. Easy. Really very easy. You know how many trees you have per acre. And then, I have the first number, the first approach to know how many gallons I have to irrigate per tree in one month. Okay? You know your flow, flow rate, gallons per hour per tree, and now I know how many hours I have to irrigate per month, per day, per week, okay? This is the basic information that you have to know. And you can, you can make the calculation for, all, for one year. For one year, you can make the calculation. And you will know how much water you need to irrigate one acre in one year, okay? If it's two, if it's three acre food, if it's four acre food, you can, okay? You can do that. It's the basic information, okay? 80% now during flowering, no less than 80%. Could be 10% less, 10% more. It's part of the adjustment. If you are using some, some um, um, so, um, um, soil moisture monitoring, yes, you can adjust. There is no problem. But I could say so far, around 80% during flowering, okay? 80% of the evaporation. For sure, cloudy days, you will need less. Warm, uh, sunny days, you will need more. I like to make this calculation uh, weekly, not monthly, just weekly, okay? It's important to adjust the, the irrigation, okay? Basic information that you need, you need to know and you have to use. Fertilizer. What? Oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. It's, it's available and I can send, if, if, if somebody is asking for that uh, 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 information, I can send. I can send it, okay? No problem. Okay, fertilizer. Other big question. Critical times. The first critical time. Flowering, fruit set, spring flash. We are in the beginning of the first critical time, okay? The second critical time, June, July, August, summer flash. And the third critical time, September, October, November, okay? Flower development, okay? The first critical time, nitrogen. Nitrogen is important. It's important to apply. I showed you there is a, there is a lot of competition between flower, new fruit, your actual crop. If you are delaying the harvest, spring flash, root, uh, root growth, 
a lot of competition in the same time. It's important to feed your trees. It's important to give enough energy, enough nutrient to avoid competition between flowering, between set, and between spring flash. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's important. Before, before, what was the normal decision? No. Don't apply fertilizer until to see your babies, until to see your set. Today, that is not an idea. Okay? That is not an idea. There is enough information supporting applying nitrogen during flowering. You increase your crop, you reduce the alternate bearing, and you increase your fruit size. Okay? I could say for mature trees with a good, with a good, good crop, loaded trees, probably. You have to apply close to 200 pound, 200 pound of nitrogen per acre per year. Mature trees loaded, full of fruit. Okay. For sure, if you, if you are, a, look, look here. Can you see the difference? Full of flower full of set, nice spring flat, for sure. This tree is asking for energy. But if you see here, too much spring flat, not enough flower. I have to adjust that. I cannot think to apply the same amount. I cannot think to apply here to thin in 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. But here, yes, I can. Okay? It's part of the adjustment. Okay? The first critical time, flowering, fruit set, spring flash. Okay? And if you are, and if you are delaying your harvest, or do you, you want to improve the fruit size, keep in mind this. The old fruit is uptaking nitrogen. Now, April, May, June, July. Potassium, April, May, June, July. Okay? You have to add more nutrients if you are delaying the harvest. Okay? Pruning. In my experience, the most powerful tool, okay? To reduce the alternate crop, increase fruit size, to have healthy trees, friendly trees, easy to pick, easy to spray, full of shoot, full of leaves, the best tool, okay? Now, Look this, keep the orchard, the ranch, open for sunlight. The bees need sunlight. If you have a crowded, overcrowded block, the bees won't fly inside the shade, okay? If it's too dark, they, they won't fly. Okay, it's important to open for sunlight. You will improve for sure your set, flowering, and the bees activity. Okay, if you are in that condition, you, 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 have, to prob you have to think to pick one branch and remove it immediately to improve the condition for bees activity. Just as an example, look here. Can you see this tree? This is the beginning of the season. Plenty of flower. Plenty of flower. The grower, when I was looking at the tree, the grower told me, Gerardo, I want to have 
the same amount of flour next spring, but with the same size tree. I don't want bigger trees because that size is perfect. I say, yes, no problem. I can do that. Look, what was the decision? Can you see that area? We cut back. The tallest and full of flower branch. That was the decision in the beginning of the season. Okay? In the spring. Look, flowering. It's easy to explain the pruners. Just removed section of the just removed the tallest branch with full of flower and no leaves. Because we know that means huge set, small fruit, sunburn. We know that. And this is the tree in the end of the season, in fall. The same tree that was the beginning of the season, and this is the end of the season. The same size tree with a lot of shoots ready to have flower again and full of fruit. To do the pruning, we thought not only in the next crop, we thought in the following crop too. Okay? We need a friendly tree, again, easy to pick, easy to spray, and we crop every year. That is our target, okay? For me, the best timing is during flowering. For me, it's the, the best moment, and it's easiest to explain to the worker what they have to do. It's really the easiest time, okay? Remove individual limbs. I like to do I, I, I like to do that kind of pruning instead of remove trees or instead of, of cut one side of the tree. Um, consider after a big pruning, you have to do regrow control. It's very, very important. Pruning means your first big pruning, probably, heavy pruning, and then after four, six weeks, you have to do regrow control. I've seen a lot of trees that was stamped one, two, three years ago, and now the tree looks probably bigger because they didn't do regrow control, okay? That is the idea, the same idea. Look, a nice tree full of flower, the decision, cut part of the flower, remove the tall branch, okay? The same here, the tree is, is, is unbalanced, too much flower, too much, look here, too much flower, it's, some, it's a weak branch, remove. Okay? Sometimes you can see some exposed fruits. Pick and, and prune. Okay? It's important to do early. Okay? Harvest. Probably you are, you are starting the harvest. Uh, I told you, my concern is to have a cold and wet spring. And for sure, if we can remove part of the crop early, for sure it's going to be good to help your next crop, okay? Flowering, set. Elisa is speaking. Early pruning branch. I showed you some example. Um, I know you have, to con you have to include in your decision what is going on in the market, what is happening in Mexico, if they are picking, not picking, the price, everything. But from the technical point of view, it's good to remove part of the crop early, okay? Tree health, after a cool and wet winter with a lot of rain, for sure. Check, check your preventing and curative management, especially against Phytophthora. Remember, if there is Phytophthora, 
there is no root. If there is no root, there is no up water uptake, nutrient uptake, no crop. Okay. Finally, no crop. Okay. Just some example of, of trying injection. Just for the weakest tree. Okay. Um, I have seen so far it's not so popular to do some trunk injection here, uh, but I have seen growers doing that, and the result looks very, very nice. Okay, the most efficient way to use phosphorus acid buffer solution, okay, is using trunk injection, okay, and then foliar spray. The last. The last, from the efficiency point of view, the last method to apply phosphorus acid is through the irrigation. Okay? It's through the irrigation. Plant growth regulators. Okay? And I know many of you are using. Um, to be honest, so far I haven't seen good result using uh, chief that is the only plant grow regulator that you can use here in United in, in California GIF. okay but I think it's important in this spring in this condition to try again okay to try again just leave areas without without a spray just to check the difference and to check the benefit. Okay, you, I probably you know a lot of this. I think, I think we are in the right time to do this week or next week. Okay, but try, try, because what is the idea to improve the fruit set and to improve the fruit size? Okay, again with a cold and wet spring, good help. Okay, good help. Okay, I'll tell you about bees, pollination, fertilization, irrigation, pruning, tree health, harvest. We have to do everything in 12 weeks, just 12 weeks. To prune later, to harvest later. It's going to be totally different, okay? You, but you can do that. You can do that. But you have, to, you have to know the negative effect to delay some, some labor, okay? This is a summary. This is the summary. The task schedule. Irrigation, fertilization, pollination, pruning. The months the phenological state, just to remind you, you have what you have to do the next month, okay? Harvest with control, look, avoid competition with avocado flowers, remove part of the crop early, size picking to remove the largest fruit, keep in mind trips, per se, monitoring, plant growth regulator. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ryan Giacalone. I work with Phytech in Southern California as a, con a customer success manager. Uh, my job basically is to help growers like you guys farm more efficiently and more sustainably. Uh, we work with 650 of the world's top growers. Some of the names that you might recognize up there are Limonera, Brokaw, Irvine Company, um, Sierra Pacific, and Staley Farms. One of the largest portions of our service that we can provide you is plant monitoring. So one of our full field monitoring systems is going con to consist of three dendrometers. These are going to be placed on the tree at the tree trunk. There's going to be three trees that are selected from an NDVI scan that we can provide to you guys. Um, that's going to show us the most average performing portion of your block. Um, 
Alongside that is going to be a water pressure sensor. This is going to provide during irrigation and post irrigation summaries of exactly how much water is going through your lines. Um, another thing that we offer is the soil moisture probe. This is going to be stuck into the ground three feet and it's going to provide soil moisture percentages at six depths every six inches. Um, and we also provide a fruit sensor. This fruit sensor is much like our dendrometer. It's going to be, it's going to allow you to plant the, or uh, to track the fruit growth from the time of installation at about the size of a golf ball, 25 millimeters, until harvest. Um, it's actually a really nice sensor. I have a slide that's gonna go over that a little bit later. Um, all of these sensors are going to be connected to our data logger. This can be placed in the field, outside of the field. Really what it is, is it's just going to um, operate on solar power. It connects to our cloud. And when the sensors are sending off readings every 15 minutes to an hour, you're going to be getting these readings. Um, something that I'll address later in this presentation as well are our fertigation monitoring, our hydraulic monitoring, and our temperature monitoring systems. So this is a little bit more in depth about our plant andrometers. Like I said, we're gonna put three of these on three individual trees in your block. And this is going to give you what we call the maximum daily shrinkage. So these numbers here that you're seeing are not the overall growth. This is merely the number of microns of digression from this peak here to this valley. From those readings, we will be able to give you a red to green stress indication telling you how your trees are performing. This is also going to coincide with our fruit sensors. With our fruit sensors on our website, you're gonna be seeing something similar. There's gonna be one to three of these per tree, and these are gonna go around the largest portion of the avocado. Uh, we will allow you to set a trend line, or it's a target size line, so you put in the date that you would like to harvest, the size that you would like to harvest at, and this is gonna help you to monitor, you know, with stress and without stress, how your how your harvest is going to look at the end of the season. Um, so right here, I have a picture from our website that's gonna show you how you're going to be able to use these sensors together. So right up top here is going to be the plant sensor. You're gonna see those daily expansions and contractions. Um, and below that, you're gonna be seeing this fruit growth. This trend line that's been set is to harvest at X number of millimeters, um, and we have little diagrams that'll show you the size in millimeters to the the um, the size per the the amount of fruit per bin, um, and this is going to allow you to pick at any size, right? You're going to be able to see this trend line whether you're above or below it, and we've actually had um, growers who are using this to size pick on a large scale. They put in the exact size that they would like to harvest at. They, you know, maybe they're gonna have two or three harvests a year. And with each of these fruit sensors, they're able to track each and every single one of those sizes of fruit. And it's shown to be very successful with their harvesting. They're allowed to communicate with their marketing team, with their harvesting team, and tell them after, you know, a, a year or two with Phytech, what the trend's looking like, how, many, how much fruit you're gonna pick, how many pounds per acre, what size you should be expecting, and you know, what you should be marketing to the, uh, uh, the buyers of the product. Um, from here, I have a snapshot of our website. So this is going to this is going to show you guys exactly what you can see um, if you do go with Biotech. So what you're noticing here is, let me just point these out. These blue spots up here, these blue rectangles, are the irrigation sets. Um, below that is going to be our plant sensor. This is the maximum daily shrinkage and the soil moisture probe is gonna be set here at the bottom of the screen. You can view this in either a profile or a root zone. The root zone is the average between the six inch, one foot, and one and a half foot depths, uh, where you know, most of the nutrient uptake is occurring. Something that you'll be able to notice here, something that will help you, it, it'll create a more informed environment for you to utilize your irrigation efficiently, is as you irrigate, um, depending on weather, depending on a, a all of the factors, you're going to see an increase in MDS um, until the next irrigation. So notice how it's at about 108 here. It's gradually increasing, especially with this day of excessive heat, and then it continues to increase to the point of an irrigation, right? What you're seeing here is the tree is happy. 
you're seeing a lot of green stress, which means that you're staying below a threshold of maximum daily shrinkage, and you're staying on positive growth patterns. Once you get to here, this is when our first stress um, indication is set off, and this is when you need to irrigate. This is a great picture of perfectly timed irrigation because they're using water efficiently. Um, as, and then they follow up in the days to come because of the excessive weather with more irrigations. Um, another thing that I would like to highlight is down here in the bottom right hand corner, you're getting at every single one of these depths of soil moisture percentage. Um, this is a volumetric soil moisture probe, so it's going to tell you exactly how much, uh, how much water and, you know, with that available nutrients are going to be in your soil. Um, and another thing to note is that this irrigation is penetrating all the way down to three feet. Another th uh, service that we offer is automation. We work fairly closely with WiseCon and we utilize their hardware in their open API to allow you to automate through our website. Um, this is going to provide you with possibilities like automating your pond, your pump, um, and we will also be able to monitor all of these things that you're going to automate. automate. So you're going to be able to monitor your, um, how your pump's performing, how the filter's performing, and you're going to get flow readings and infield pressures. The infield pressure is going to come from our, our uh, irrigation sensors, and it's, it's really nice at the end of a week to throw together your summary, say how much you use, and you can even take this and, and say, well, you know, in next year we're going to need more water. Um, because we used this much this year and this is how our trees were performing. From that point, you can also monitor each individual valve in the, um, in the site at the block as well. Um, after you go forward with automating with Phytech, you're going to have this diagram here that's going to show you the monitoring from the pond to the pump to the filter to each of the main lines and then we are also monitoring fertigation at this point. So, with each fertigation event, you're going to get a summary at the end of it. And this can be used so that you guys don't have to do the paperwork yourself. You're going to get each of the readings. You're going to get how many parts you irrigated in or um, sent through the irrigation lines. And this is really nice to allow you guys to push a little bit more towards the technological aspect instead of having to uh, do bookkeeping yourself. Um, with our automation, you are going to use the planner to set up your irrigation events, right? So this is what our planner is going to look like on the website. Um, these dark blue rectangles here are going to be an executed irrigation, and these ones are the ones that are upcoming. So you're going to be able to see also at the end of the week what we call for, what our irrigation recommendation is, and up to this point how much you've done, how, how satiated your soil is. Um, and this is taken from the uh, crop coefficient, and ETO provided by Cima stations. Um, another thing that we just rolled out is that you will have peak hours um, so that you can be more energy efficient. And it's going to save you a couple dollars on the back end. Uh, when you're going through and you're setting up these irrigation plans, this is going to allow you to uh, not irrigate on peak hours, therefore saving you money. Um, it's a really nice setup. It's very easy to use. You'll be able to document uh, fertigation events, foliar sprays, anything else that's going on in your in your blocks and this it, it's gonna have um, you're going to be able to dip back from as long as you've had Phytech, as long as you've been using the planner um, this is gonna provide you with that information. The features of our planner it will allow you to have complete irrigation and planning control um, you can group together wells, pumps, valves, and filters, or you could break them apart as you, as you wish. If you'd like to have one valve going at a certain point or one valve open at a certain point, um, from that well, you're going to be able to break this up. So let's say that you're irrigating, you know, half of a ranch at any given time. You'll be able to set up through our planner um, exactly the hardware that's going to go into that and automate it from that point so that you aren't going to have to sit there and turn on each individual valve and automate and, and go forward with that every single time that you're setting up an irrigation. Um, with our monitoring as well, this is going to give you an enhanced visibility of exactly what your irrigation is doing to your trees. You know, 60 years ago or even 10 years ago, you're irrigating in, 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 in the dark really. This is going to allow you to see, you know, maybe I've been irrigating too much for the past 60 years. Maybe I need to irrigate more at this given point and allocate your irrigation, your allotted irrigation amounts 
over the course of the year. Um, with our planner, you're going to receive push notifications, whether the pond level is, is you know, coming, uh, becoming low, if pressure is high or low, uh, if the flow rate is off, and if, you need the, if the filter needs to be cleaned pretty much. Um, as I said earlier, it's very easy to use, utilize our system. Pretty much what you're going to do is you're going to click on any given day of the week. You're going to set the duration when the, when the irrigation is going to start and you're going to say how long you would like it to go. On top of that, you're going to be able to pulse irrigate if that's what you would like to do. Um, so set the runtime, set the recurrency. If you would like this, this um, to go every single week, if you would like it to go three days a week, exactly what you're allowed to do with each irrigation set, and you can apply that to the rest of the season if you would like. Um, while the irrigation is running, if the irrigation starts, you guys aren't dead to rights to follow through on that. If you notice something's wrong, if you're having low pressure, maybe a line blew apart, you're going to be able to pause it, fix the situation, and then go back and start running it again. Um, and once it starts, you can say, I don't want it to be a three-hour irrigation set. I'd like it to go to an hour. Um, you're going to get push notifications with the start, the stop, and pause of each irrigation. And this is going to also send you that summary that I talked about at the end of the irrigation. Um, very in-depth or very broad, however you guys would like to plan it out. Um, our planner is compatible with third-party hardware solutions. Right now, we're utilizing WiseCon very heavily. We are developing our own automation system, uh, but at this point, WiseCon is, is they're doing a great job. And like I said, we will provide you with real-time data. Some of the other capabilities that we have with our service are going to be uh, frost and wind machine monitoring. Uh, this, is, this has been very useful to a lot of growers in the area. Um, with our, our temperature sensor, you're going to see the ambient temperature. You're going to see the humidity, the relative humidity, and through both of those, you'll be able to get the wet bulb temperature as well. Um, You'll also be able to set low temperature thresholds, so at 33 degrees, if you would like to be alerted, or 32 degrees, you can receive a push notification, a text message, or a phone call, um, which might come at 2.30 in the morning, but it's very consistent. Um, with all of this as well on our, our uh, frost control app, you're able to see the last 24 hours of weather transposed over the current weather. So at, you know, at 10 o'clock yesterday, it was 65 degrees. If you're looking at 63 degrees today instead, you're going to say, well, maybe there's a little bit of a colder night, and you're going to be able to see that throughout the entirety of the day. Um, you know, get on, get on sending somebody out earlier, or maybe you know uh, whether or not you're going to have to run the wind machines. Um, with that as well, if you have one of these nice wind machines here that's controlled by your phone, you can take our temperature and you can turn it on. And you can also see whether or not it's in um, manual or auto running. Um, with a older wind machine where you're going to have to engage the clutch yourself, we're going to give you an on and off notification for that as well. Uh, I talked very briefly about earlier how we're going to set the sites in your, in your block. So right here is going to be from this satellite image, what we, what we figure out to be the best point to put it. It's going to be the most indicative point of your block, and to save costs, you're just going to have the three dendrometers, the irrigation sensor, soil moisture probe, and everything right there. These um, NDVI maps are updated every five days. Um, like I said, it's going to give us a recommended, sen recommended sensor location, which can be overruled by you if you believe that there's a different spot in your, in your block that's going to be more indicative or a spot that you would like to pay more attention to, we can go ahead and put the site there. This will give you low growth alerts. So if you're seeing that one of these spots right here in the green is red two weeks later, that's going to flip a switch and you're going to notice that something's going wrong, um, you know, whether it be root rot or any, any of the other very detrimental things that can happen in your in your avocado blocks. Um, this is also going to allow you to open up management zones. So as you're seeing here, very green, very healthy. Over here, you're going to need to tend to uh, the plant's needs a little bit more. Um, whereas before, you, maybe you were able to see these satellite images. This is going to come through on our website and on, your, on our mobile app. And you're going to be able to check it once a day, like I said, updated uh, once a week. 
Going forward, we're hoping to provide elevation, soil type, and nitrogen vegetation maps on this. It's going to be transposed. So on our website, you click something, it'll bring you up the MDVI imaging. And going forward, we're hoping to give you some more options with that. That's all that I have for you guys today. Um, if you have any questions, you can come up to our, our table at the end of the uh, presentations, and hopefully I'll be able to answer them for you. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, yeah. Well, thank you guys for having us. My name is Guillermo Valenzuela. I'm from WiseCon. I want to thank Ryan, too, for doing half of my presentation. <laughs> thank you there. Uh, no, but he's, yeah, he, we, they're a very good partner, and we work with them very closely. And uh, so, yeah, what I'm going to try to do is not get into the same things that he got into, because you guys already heard about you know, frost monitoring, decision making with the sensors, dendrometers, soil moisture. He went into depth. I'm going to focus on the control side of things, which is kind of like what we do. I like to say Wisecon or drop control, our product, it's like the remote control of the TV, but for the irrigation system. Uh, it's to basically execute when you need to be done with the pumps, the valves, the fertilizer injection systems. Uh, remotely, either through Fitech and using Fitech as a recommendation or what they are telling you on the agronomy side to do, or by, by your own decision, by digging a hole and you know, identifying the soil moisture by hand, but then deciding how, what to irrigate and execute it correctly, the execution. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about Wisecon, then drop control the product, and then go over some use cases that again are going to be focused on the control side of things other than the other topics that other presenters might be talking about. <laughs> so first, Wisecon. Wisecon was founded back in 2006 in South America, in Chile. And from there, it expanded into California in 2015. That's since we, we've, been there, we've been here since 2015. Currently, we have our office in Fresno. And for there, we are servicing 10 states, but of course, California being the main one. Uh, we got over, actually, that number's not updated. It's 500,000 acres currently of permanent crops automated, and we got over 17,000 units deployed. So this is a system that has been you know, installed recurrently in, in different crops and different ranches. 2,500 users in five different countries, and uh, we got currently 10 API integrations, which I think is one of them who we're working with on the agronomy side and what they, they do. So there's a few others out there. Um, currently, we work everything through distributors, as I mentioned, Fitech is one here in the region. We also work very closely with Coast Water Solutions. They're here too, if you guys want to talk to them. Um, so they, the, the distribution network today basically provides all the system design, they install it. You, in cases like Fitech, they provide the agronomic services and the maintenance, because these things fail. This get, this, these things, it would be a lie if I stood here and told you they don't. They get hit by tractors, they radio communications, weather. So it's always important to have a local person that's less than a couple of hours away drive to go fix anything, especially in those summers, uh, hot summer months. Uh, we provide the material, we provide the training, we provide you know customer care to our distribution network, and of course to our growers. There's there's 10 people sitting in Fresno right now answering the phone, ask, answering any questions you might have, any problems from you forgot your password to the VFD didn't start. And they will help you diagnose the issue and get in contact with Fitech or Coast Water Solutions to go take care of you guys in the field. So this is how we've made it possible to continue running over 15 years of ag irrigation automation. So, uh, I think I'm, yeah, so here's a little bit of what we do. We like to divide our our solution in three uh, parts. So when I talk to, to people about irrigation automation, a lot of people think agronomy, okay? ET, soil moisture, what the tree needs, you know, to have that perfect combination of air and oxygen in the soil for the roots to intake most the most water possible, most fertilizer, more metabolism, bigger avocados. But that's just one part of the problem, which is the agronomy, the water demand. The grower needs to face two other problems. His hydraulic limitations, his irrigation system, what he bought, what has the, the gallons per minute he can push out, and the water source. Where am I getting my water source from? Where am I getting from a deep well? Am I getting it from a canal? The quality of my water, the relationship with the district. 
So usually we have the district, we have the irrigation company, and we have the agronomist. And the agronomist don't talk hydraulics, the hydraulic guy don't talk agronomy, and the agronomy nobody talks to the district. So it's, that's when you have to take care of the whole. And if you're being told to irrigate every day, but your district is giving you water once a week, then you can't irrigate every day, or you need a reservoir or some other solution. So we basically go from the beginning to the end. We're monitoring and controlling every piece of equipment and sensor from the, from the top to the bottom for you for facilitate the decision and especially facilitate the control. So we start with reservoir level, canal flow monitoring, well monitoring, especially for sigma and all regulations, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, pumping level, standing level, water flow, energy consumption, anything related to the pumps at the, at the water source. We automate and monitor everything related with the irrigation system, start and stop the pump. We can even change, change the set points on variable frequency drives if we have different topographies and we can irrigate one block with 30 pounds and the other block with 70 pounds and not every block with 70 pounds. It's the most reliable and usually in the field it's the best way to do it. But there are different alternatives out there. So what we do is that we sync the cloud with the farm. That's how we made this work. It does not rely on the cloud to run your irrigation. You schedule your irrigation on your phone, it's pushed into the field, cellular signal is lost, it will irrigate anyway. Because it has the intelligence and if this pressure spikes, it will kill the pump before blowing the pipe and before we put it into the cloud, locally. And that's kind of where we, make, we crack the code and that's how we've been able to make remote control automation and irrigation systems that are at this level of complexity because you guys know that irrigating you know, your backyard is not the same task as irrigating your farm, but many companies seem to think they, they are the same um, in terms of complexity. And then we got an app that is right now covered by this, by us, but we also have an app. So, so we got three main stakeholders, and you see, yeah, no, I don't have that map. We have three main, main stakeholders that are using this. This app, where you, we have the irrigator, that's the guy that's doing the last mile, and we got a bunch of irrigators here in the, in the in the county actually using this, so they don't have to go out there and do it manually. An open and close valve, they can do it from their house. They're checking if the system is running from their house in the morning before they jump in the bathroom. I mean, this is the level of visibility. That initially you think, well, you know, this is this is I'm I'm, I'm going to be converted with automation. No. We still need you to run the remote control. We don't tell you what to watch, we just give you the remote control instead of having to do it manually. And so that's the first stakeholder that who's deciding if they're gonna irrigate block one Monday afternoon or Tuesday morning. Then you got the second stakeholder that is usually the ranch manager or maybe the owner that's looking into what has happened, checking into the flow meters, checking into the soil moisture sensors, making decisions to irrigate more or irrigate less. And then uh, finally, you got well, Index Fresh or an investor or an owner that is looking for report reporting. It's looking for for uh, you know in water balance information, sustainability reports. How much water are we using? How much water did we buy? How much water did we use? They want reports, high level reports. They're not looking to the pros, and they're not look, they're not scheduling the irrigation on a day to day basis. So with these software platforms, we cover both. We cover all, or all three stakeholders. We give the remote control for the irrigator and the reportability access for the in the express in this case. This is uh, the app. Uh, it has you know a bird's eye view. You can set up if it's irrigating, if there's a dry or a wet, or if you have an alarm, like a pressure alarm. It pushes notifications. So a lot of irrigators have told me that it's very easy for them to wake up in the morning and see, okay, block one open, block one closed, block two open, block two closed, block three open. Okay, perfect. Block three is running, they didn't even have to open the app. Um, and then of course the reportability. How is our irrigation system performing? How many inches did we put up there? What time did it actually run compared to what I actually scheduled it to run? Very simple to schedule, you just set your initial time, how many hours you want to run, you can do your fertigation, select the tank, how long you're going to run, and if you have a pH control system, you can even set a pH set point, and the pump will run out of it, and inject that acid to maintain a pH level in your main line. 
the, visual, the, the reportability goes from very uh, in-depth, like this case, which is September 4, 2017, block 1A, scheduled to run from 7 to 12. It was supposed to run at 1,200 gallons per minute, but it already did 1,100 gallons per minute, so it had an 8% less uh, volume put out in the field. So I already know I have to make up for that 8%. And then I maybe need to change my schedule flow because it's not 1,200 anymore. My system run now, now runs 1,100. So now I know. And I start running more precise to the volume. And then fertilizer would be the same way. The good thing about valve control is that this gives, gives you flexibility in case you have water problems. In this case, we're looking at, for example, this is almonds. And they have two blocks, well, three. One A, one B, and we see one C. They irrigate one A, it is a big chunk. And then B and C, they put them together. But then they also have the plumbing on the valves to run by variety. So they can irrigate the non-parallels by themselves. And then they irrigate the sonoras and the modern rays separate. So when they're shaping the non-parallels, they're irrigating the other ones and vice versa. So you can get into very detailed examples like this guys. Or maybe just shrinking your block. You know what, the city is giving me less water now. I need to irrigate one valve at time, not two. You can do all that remote now. This is a guy that's going bulls. We got some guys going there 10 times a day. This is blueberries, so we'll give them the 15 pulses in a day <laughs> with fertilizer around them. But the system very clear, so it shows you on top what you schedule and underneath what really happened. So it's very visual to compare on a daily and weekly basis. You can go and hit the button that says week up there, and you can look at it at a weekly basis. And then you start running reports if you gotta go monthly, season, I want to compare it with the weather, and we can start doing all those analysis. This is more for a day-to-day -day operation. And then we got all the charts. You can you got some preset charts. You can create your own charts. In those terms, the software is very flexible. This is a flow meter, for example. In the valley, um, it's running uh, like five CFS. <laughs> this guy's stuck in CFS. Um, but and then in, in the black columns, you have the the actual acre feet per week. In green, you have the flow, and in red, you have the totalizer of the flow meter to make sure that we are matching with what the field says. It's also important to calibrate it. So moisture, very simple methodology on top. We put three sensors. This is just for sake of the example. Each one of them is telling me um, one, one, each one of the depths, uh, um, let's say uh, one, two, and three feet. Each spike, it's an irrigation event because as uh, Fitech was showing the soil moisture sensors, when you irrigate, you fill the air so poor with, uh, the poor uh, air with water, so your water content goes up. Um, so each spike is an irrigation event, and with this you can see how deep the water is getting. And I'm trying to keep the water away from that three feet sensor, it says 14 inch, but it's a three feet sensor. So every time I spike, you know, I over irrigate it, because I don't want to get that deep. I don't have roots down there, 90 centimeters, whatever it is, I don't have roots there. Why is it spiking? Ah, I irrigated when it rained. So, okay, I shouldn't have, or I could have cut my water a little bit on that irrigation. So, moisture sensor, there's a methodology we can teach you how to define your duration, your frequency, but there are great companies out there like Fight Tech that are doing this for you and are doing all the agronomy, decision making, you know, help to, in order to get a maximum. Uh, yield in order to get uh, as, as, as the, the most tonnage per acre feet possible. We got alarms and alerts. You can call you, send you texts. Guys ask you to get called three times <coughs> at night for frost. Those nights that just in case they did fall asleep. Um, you know, some text messages, emails. You set them up. Any sensor with a threshold will send you an alert. And then here are some, some case studies. This is, for example, the high frequency irrigation guide. This is a pistachios in the valley. Uh, we'll just, you know, we, we do have a, a video, a, a, an avocado case study from Peru and Chile. And then we are going to show at the end of the event because we need to upload it. But uh, for you guys that are interested in watching that, at the end of the event, we'll just project it here if you guys want to see it. This is in pistachios. This guy went on those big 12 inch valves. He was irrigating once a week, switched to three times a day or twice a day. 
and he started saving water, but the most important thing is that his off-year production increased by 40%, and that alone paid for the investment that like three times in one year on this 800 acres of pistachio. Uh, so this guy started doing high frequency. We had other guys irrigating almonds 10 times a day for 20 minutes. We tried pulse irrigation in Chile, in hills, in work, so I'm not gonna tell people here to do that. But it's a possibility, and, and it shows you a little bit of the range of possibilities that you have to play around with your irrigation system. This is another example, it's very interesting, it's in the almond, it's in almonds. This is a big grower in Northern California, he told us we're gonna give you our worst branch, 2018. And the problem here was, we analyzed it a little bit with the irrigation company here, so they had all the valves on the west side of the ranch. Big pipe, high speeds, two engines, electric and diesel, both with variable frequency drives, and they would operate four valves at a time. From top to bottom, 20 valves. So what would end up happening is that this, this pump started ramping up and down and the distribution uniformity was a mess because how they were operating, they would open four valves and go in the, in the quad and open up the next four valves and then go back and close the, the last four valves so at some point you have eight valves open. And you're feeling light from west to east. So uh, we changed the whole way they operated the valves and we went to sequential control. You open four valves and then before opening, you open valve number five and you close number, valve number one. Then you open valve number six and you close, close valve number two. That's the distribution uniformity. We didn't do anything else to that branch but changing the way they operated the valves. These guys are doing all the 8,000 acres with us now because they have that level of control and that level of capability. And then of course, this is an example of well monitoring. We've got some ranches with over 80 wells in Central Valley. We're monitoring groundwater level, pumping level, drawdown, flow, pressure, power. We're giving you an overall pump efficiency test every 15 minutes if you have all the correct sensors. So your pump never works out of that, of that curve, especially on hilly topographies. I'm from Chile, so I'm used to what you guys have here. I've been showing all flat land. It seems a little bit easier. This, this, it's just bigger. Um, but yeah, sigma reporting and all that connecting directly to your GSA. We have APIs, as I mentioned before, that we connect with third-party companies and we can provide this information to anybody that requires it for, uh, uh, for you know, reporting purposes. Uh, so in short, why drop control? Well, the control architecture that I explained at the beginning and how the system operates, we disconnect it from the cloud and collaborative between the nodes. So if the valve on the other side of the hill didn't open, the pump will stop on this side of the hill without connecting to the cloud. That, that actually is what we have patented a few years ago. Um, everything is on one platform, so you're looking at your well and your soil moisture sensor on one platform. The software capabilities really has had outstanding acceptance in the, in the market, and I see a couple of users here in the audience, and we're gonna have a review on the opinion later. Everything is serviced remotely, so 75, 80% of the times that the <coughs> distributor or the service company comes to the field, they already know what needs to be done uh, and the parts that they need to change. Because everything as we're monitoring the field, we're also monitoring the network, so we know how the batteries are, the signal, or you know, if we had a problem with an antenna because a bird chewed on it. Okay, we're gonna go change the antenna. These things happen. The important thing is that you have a phone number where you call. Without, in our case, you have two. You have ours, and you have your distributors. Um, it's open to any sensor, so off-the-shelf components, anything that you might have had from the pure sense era, and I'm probably just saying something that only a few of you might remember or know. We can use those. Complete API enabling, that's what we do with Fitech very closely, and with other you know, six companies out there. They're all very good, all focused on what they're doing, and. Um, and we're working with, with, with several of them being that control, that remote control for them. Uh, the support network and the training resources, as I said, we got 10 people interested. We're getting 1,000 phone calls a week on Fixie. A lot of them are, I forgot my password, some are more uh, serious. Um, and then the local person, you know, the fact that you can call, you know, you know Ryan or Miguel here or anybody that can come out and service you. And it's competitive, it's pricing competitive. I mean, 
the ROI is probably an average of two years. A lot of people are spending for this investment in 18 months or in a year, especially guys that are running on peak. Just stay off peak or that extra labor that you're paying just to go out there and switch it. And if not, just the time saving, you know? The fact that you can have control and not having to be actually out there. I got guys driving 40 miles, go start a pump. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. You can do that from your phone. Without any, just start it and stop it. And that's me. Well, that's not me, actually. That's uh, Jake. <laughs> he, he lives here. He's in the coast. He's our district manager. That's his contact information. I'm here. I'm going to be in the back if anybody has any questions or would like to, you know, and, and any information from me. Hi, my name is uh, Adam Matthews. Can you guys uh, hear me in the back? Give a little, a little wand. Yeah. Right close to my mouth. Nice. So um, I want to also introduce uh, Brett Waterman. He's in the back here. He's the sales manager. So wave your hand, Brett. Let everybody know who you are. There you go. Um, so before I get into the presentation, I want to give a brief overview of, of what Netafim is and who we are. So uh, Netafim started in 1965 on a farm out in Israel with a leaky hose. So uh, they noticed that where there was a slow drip next to this uh, one tree, that tree was going a lot better than the uh, other trees that were getting hand watered. So they put a bunch of holes in those uh, hoses and that's what started uh, drip irrigation. Um, since then we have innovated and led the industry in drip irrigation. Um, but along the way we've picked up some other products. We diversified our, uh, our portfolio if you will. So we've brought in um, water meters, we've brought in valves, we've brought in uh, filtration from small one inch disc filters all the way up to massive sand media filters. And I am not too proud to say that when I started at Netafim two years ago, I thought I knew pretty much everything there was to know about irrigation, having been in the industry for about 20 years. And uh, I was wrong, dead wrong. <laughs> the team at Netafim knows an incredible amount. And every day that I'm there, I learn more. So if you have any questions about irrigation in general, about any of the products that Netafim offers, feel free to come up and ask us. Um, I'm more than happy to talk with you, and so is, uh, so is Brett. But today we're going to talk about a product that we have coming out here very shortly. It's our new control system. It's called GrowSphere. Um, and the whole point with GrowSphere was to essentially take all of the operations, all of the uh, uh, irrigation, fertigation, all the weather sensor information, to take all that information and, and make it uh, uh, easy to access and easy to understand. We don't want to make anything overly complicated here, right? When you, when you pick up your iPhone, um, you don't see all the processes that go into making a simple app work. And that was kind of the goal here, was to make a very simple product that did a whole lot for you. So our value proposition. Where we got the name of uh, GrowSphere was essentially when we were creating this product, we put a bunch of spheres up on a board. Agronomic, operations, hydraulic, right? How, uh, how are we going to aggregate this information? How are we going to present this information to you? And uh, what information is most important for the growers? So your crop, your field uh, data, your weather um, would be one source of information, right? And then we separate it out to labor and energy. When's the best time to pump water into your wells or from your wells? And then, of course, the hydraulic design. And that's a, another thing we have here at Netafim is a lot of design workers, um, a, a design team, if you will. So uh, we were able to um, reach out to them and, and get some further information on how, uh, how to hydraulically design systems. So... We're looking at monitoring, reporting, alert notification, um, and uh, uh, crop advisors. We've got a lot of um, uh, all-in-one operating systems here. So we've got a lot of operations that we want to take and put them into one simple, sorry, this microphone's throwing me off here. <laughs> Feels so important talking with it. So when we're, when we're looking at monitoring and reporting and notifications, we want to make all that seamless. We want to make it work for you without having to uh, put much thought into it yourself. But we didn't want to just take this information from ourselves. So we reached out to all of the farm managers that we have across the world that we are in constant contact with. So it's not just us here in the US, it's our teams in Brazil and in France and in South Africa um, and throughout Israel. 
we wanted to talk to as many people as we possibly could to get their information on what's important to them. We wanted to talk to agronomists, people that are on the, uh, on the ground floor every day, coming up with irrigation programs, looking at diseases to see what was important to them. Irrigation managers, the guy that's actually showing up and programming the irrigation, who's walking the fields, he's checking the soils, what's important to him? And of course the guys that are actually working in the field, if they see a breakout in the field, do they know how to uh, quickly run up to the controller and, and pause it? Um, we wanted to make it easy for those guys to understand too and make changes if needs be. So, when we're looking at our hardware, what you're actually going to get into the field, we've got a couple different options here. Um, the MAX controller is our main controller. That's our big PLC. We've got a flex controller, which is a small little unit. It does not have a faceplate, it'd just be out in the field. Um, there's the Eco Act and then the Eco Sense and the Eco One. And all of these units can be directly connected to our uh, website. Um, they can be uh, operated locally with Bluetooth. Um, the Flex Control has a little bit more uh, capabilities from directly on top of the uh, controller there. There's a screen which you can um, operate, makes it easy to use. And when we created this hardware, we realized that uh, we are irrigation people. We are not hardware people. So we went to ABB, which is a $30 billion a year Swiss company that does nothing but make PLCs. Day in and day out, that's what they do. They make PLCs for uh, automation, for the car industries, for uh, VFDs and your pumps. Um, once you see that little ABB sign, you'll see it everywhere. They're an enormous company. So we reached out to them and they gave us a team of six people that work with us day in and day out for the last year to develop the hardware to make sure that um, all of the uh, uh, capabilities that we want from hardware were available to us and that we could expand upon these units when, when that time comes. So we're real happy with the work that we've done with them and we'll continue to do with them. So when you log in, when you're on the controller itself, this is what you're gonna see. And again, it, uh, it pretty much just gives you a layout of what's happening here on the, uh, on the grow sphere. So the general information is gonna tell you this is the program that's running. It'll tell you how long into that program there is, or how long you have uh, still to go. It'll tell you what your fertigation is happening. All right, so you have two dosing channels and you can name those channels instead of just having it channel one, two, three, and four, you can name it based upon your acid or your fertilizer that you're gonna be using, your CAN-17. Um, put in all of your, uh, your targets what the actual target is for your EC, your target for your pH, and the system will automatically monitor and change them based on your recommendations. Um, it'll also tell you what's gonna be coming up next, what's gonna water next. So all of this, when you, when you log in, you're gonna see a full snapshot of what's running, what's fertilizing, and if you want to, you can make adjustments to the screen. So the hardware is also backwards compatible. We have, um, about 20 years ago, maybe even a little bit further along, we had, um, we had a product called uh, NMC. We're still selling it today. It's a really popular product for us. Uh, a little, little long in the tooth, but the, uh, the software and the hardware still works really well. Um, and with it, uh, we had RadioNet and SingleNet that, uh, that worked seamlessly. That was our uh, telemetry product. SingleNet is a two-wire system, so there's no radios involved. It's just two wires that leave the controller, and they go out to little nodes in the field that turn on and off when they're supposed to. And then our radio system, which is just that. It's an RF radio system. We also have these NET RTUs, which is from an, uh, a previous product um, that uses lower radios. So um, the controller can also communicate with that. So for long range, when you need to go uh, 13 miles, 14 miles, we have a product that can make that work for you. So it's all, all backwards compatible. And moving forward, we're going to be switching over to uh, the Eco Act and, um, and the cell repeater from our Flex. So at any given time, you can have, um, if you only need to start a pump, let's say, and monitor uh, one tensiometer and uh, maybe run one or two valves, you can just have uh, the Flex unit out in the middle of the field by itself. It does not need to be connected to anything else. It can run manually all by itself. You can walk up to it with your Bluetooth, connect, make any changes. You can log in online, make any changes you need to as it's got cell connectivity. Um, and it also can be a repeater. So you can have that as your main controller and it will repeat out to other sensors in the field um, 
other uh, um, repeaters in the field. So you can build this massive system without actually having to buy the main unit. So it could be a big cost saver. So our online platform is called Workspace. This is the overview, right? Kind of looks familiar from what we saw already today. Um, this is what your farm would look like. We have it broken up into blocks. And from here, you can tell based on the color of what's irrigated, what needs to be irrigated, and uh, what's irrigating now, what's scheduled to irrigate in the future. Uh, all that information is broken down onto blocks on the left-hand side there. Um, but when you log into this system, you can get a, a big overview of what has been irrigating and what's scheduled to irrigate that day. So you can zoom in on a block level, you can click on it, and it'll give you information based on your block. When was the last time it irrigated? When's the next time it's going to irrigate? What do the sensors look like? How much is it going to irrigate? Now, all that information is just presented to you in a very easy to understand way. Sensor data is another big thing, right? Everybody's got sensors going out in their fields now. Um, so we put their sensors out in the field. You would, you would tell us where you want them. They're geolocated. So when they plop down, you can uh, put a little geo sensor on them so you know where they're at at all times. Or if we have to come out and check or your dealer wants to come and check on one, they certainly can just by typing in the, the, uh, the GPS and uh, take you right to that sensor. Um, it'll give you... Uh, Current information on all of those sensors. Uh, sensors can be anything from a tensiometer, or dendrometer. It could be a soil moisture sensor. If it's made for irrigation, uh, we, can, we can use it. So here's our devices laid out in the field. This is the way it'll look. It'll probably be, uh, we, we kept it spaced out here um, to make it look kind of clean. But you can have as many sensors as you'd like out in the field. Uh, you can have as many uh, uh, valves as you'd like. You can have um, multiple different PLCs if you, if you chose to do so. If you have multiple fertigation machines and you want them out in the field, um, this is all of your sensors. And you can hover over any of those sensors that are on the, uh, on the pictures there. And it'll give you their information. You can click on them, it'll tell you everything about that sensor that you'd need to know. So analytics, again, we are, uh, we are irrigation people. We are not software developed people. So we reached out to Microsoft to help us out, right? They're hosting our, our database with Azure. And um, when it came to analytics, uh, we tried to figure it out and we went to uh, Microsoft and they, uh, they are considerably more proficient than we are at it. So they helped us come up with a easy way to diagnose all of this information um, to aggregate all this information so that it's easy for everybody to understand. So, um, yeah, we can, we can run our reports based on the season. You know how much you were supposed to irrigate that season, whether it's in your flowering stage or your growth stage. And we can take all of that information and put it alongside what actually is happening, alongside your sensor information, alongside your ET information. Same thing with reporting. If you want to report from any one of your sensors or multiple sensors or from ET or from your water meters, we can make any report that you want to for any season, any time frame, and we can create those reports and we can have them sent out to you daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. We can tell you uh, what your peak uh, operating times are for, um, uh, for transferring from your wells to, uh, to your lakes uh, and how much money you're saving. I mean, the reports are endless. And they're easy to use, that's the, uh, that's the best part. And if you have any questions or concerns about your reports, you can always give us a call and we're more than happy to hop on your system and uh, help you out with those as well. But again, the goal here, the overwhelming goal was to just make this as easy as possible for, for you and your team. So like I said, this product is still in development. We have been testing it out in the field. Uh, at multiple different sites here in the U.S. and across the, uh, across the world, across the globe, actually. We have these in pretty much every continent with the uh, exception of the top and the bottom. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we've been having great success. So we are ready to launch this product. We are currently in our final test, uh, testing stages with some of the new features. We have a soft launch coming out in Q2. 
So by a soft launch, I mean we're going to go out and replace some of the existing people who bought a system recently um, that want to uh, upgrade to the Grosphere. We're going to go back through and uh, replace those units. Then in Q3, we're going to have a full launch with the product. Um, we're going to continue to develop this product as we move forward, as the... Uh, as our previous product, our legacy product, when we started off with it, it was a robust controller. But over the course of 20 years, that controller has grown into something uh, quite massive. So that's exactly what's going to happen here. We have a very robust controller in the Grosphere. But as we continue to work, as farmers and uh, ranchers get back to us, as agronomists get back to us, we're going to continue to grow this product and make it exactly what, uh, what everybody's looking for. Any questions? Did I just nail it up here? <laughs> if you have any questions, you can feel free to come by. Again, uh, any questions about the, the gross fear or any questions that you'd have about um, valves or, or water meters or anything that's involved in irrigation, feel free to come over and ask us. I want to thank all of our presenters today for um, finishing on time. I was really nervous about this setup and, and agenda that we had about it going long, and we ended up... Uh, finishing a little early. So uh, please feel free to stick around, um, ask the vendors any questions that you may have directly, uh, or Gerardo if you have any questions. Um, we will do our standard uh, recording of this uh, meeting. We'll pre um, convert it to a uh, PowerPoint that we can distribute to you if you'd like to see the slides, but then it will ultimately be recorded and, and posted to our website so you can see the live video again if you uh, missed anything. Um, but I want to thank everybody for coming out today and appreciate your time and feel free to stick around and have a cup of coffee and ask any questions. But thank you again for coming.